The Added Weight of Skin Cells by Hugo Rodriguez In 500 feet, your destination will be on the right. Frank slowed the pickup to a roll as he rechecked the number on the text message. He looked up again and found the house, garage door open. He parked by the curb and called the 832 number that had texted him. Yolo? said a voice on the other end of the line after four rings. Hey, it's Frank. About picking up the... Mattress, right. Sorry, brain fart for a sec there. Are you in the neighborhood? Yeah, I think I'm right outside. 6529, right? The garage door is open? That's the one. Let me throw on a shirt and I'll be right out. If you want, pull up closer so we don't have to move much. Works for me. See you in a bit. Frank placed his car in drive again and rolled a few more feet just in time to see a guy in a polo shirt come out and wave. Frank cut the engine and then stepped out to greet the man. Hey, thanks for stopping by, the man said. I'm Adrian. Frank and... Wait, you work for Dagatech? Frank said, gesturing to the logo on the man's shirt. Yeah, I work over in acquisitions. You know them? Yeah, I'm... On the other building, doing QC work. Oh, wow, yeah, you're all the way from the other side. (laughs) Small world, big buildings. Anyway, here's your mattress, Adrian said, patting the queen-sized mattress next to him. Let's get it to the truck. It took the two men some gentle maneuvering, but they managed to load it up into the bed of the truck relatively easy. Frank jumped down and stuck out his hand for Adrian to shake. I really appreciate it, man. You said you wanted $40. Yeah, but you know what? Don't even worry about it. I'm just glad my wife finally let me talk her into giving up the damn thing. In that case, thank you, and if you're ever in my building, just shoot me a message and I'll buy you lunch. I'll definitely take you up on that. Frank managed to push the mattress into his apartment and then into his bedroom in just under an hour of inch-by-inch movement. He let the mattress fall as it landed on the bedroom and then he went back to close the door. To say that the furnishings in the one-bedroom, one-bathroom apartment were spartan would be giving them too much credit. A coffee table from an estate sale doubled as his dinner nook and his home office a makeshift cardboard TV stand and little bits of scavenged furniture here and there made his college dorm room look like a good housekeeping ad in comparison. He didn't want to use the computer and risk getting online, not right now, not when he was sure that word had filtered out that Lena had decided that the trial separation wasn't working and that she would effectively not be taking him back. He already imagined what the social media bombardment would look like. Cyber rubbernecking people on his friends list that had not messaged him in several months, reaching out to say, Hey man, how's things? I don't mean to pry, but... And then either expressing morbid curiosity or calling him all sorts of names, which, admittedly, he deserved after Lena had discovered an entire text message conversation between him and one of her painter friends that detailed, in excruciating and incriminating detail, just what kind of scumbag he was, he knew what he would be facing from her friends and the people in his now-former social circle. So it would be better instead to not think about her, watch some TV in the bedroom, and hope that sleep would come sooner rather than later in order to be able to work his distractions away the next morning at work. When he woke up that night, everything seemed normal, and the TV timer had turned itself off, and the fan was still whirring, and there was a woman at the edge of his bed. Wait, that last bit wasn't normal, and... That's why he immediately jumped out and ran out the door to fetch a knife. When he returned to the room, he got a better look at the woman, who was completely unaware that he was there. Who are you? She said nothing. She was distracted, listening to a cell phone, and stretching out her hand while she inspected a shiny ring on her finger. Yeah, he did it. I can't believe you knew about it. 
Three months? Wow! Who is this person that is suddenly able to keep things to herself? Right? I'm going to get you back for that one. Hey, I wanted to ask, are you going to Jen's tonight? That sucks! No, I get you. Last week I bailed on my dad for the same reason. He was like, you don't want to spend time with your old man. And I'm like, no dad, I'm bleeding profusely and I am in severe pain and I just want to sit here and not kill things. No, I didn't tell him that. Imagine, I just rescheduled for tomorrow. Yeah, probably the wing place off Fry and I-10. It's his favorite. He knew too? Jesus! Okay, I am definitely going to have to get a lot of people back. Okay, yeah, I'll talk to you tomorrow. She hung up the phone and looked right at Frank, but did not acknowledge him in the least. Hello? The woman didn't respond. She just went right back to staring at her hand. The window was closed, but Frank left the room, made sure that the front door was locked, and when he returned... The woman was gone. He managed to sleep somewhat fitfully that night. Frank could tell the leasing specialist at his complex was trying her hardest to keep a straight face. Haunted? she asked. Yes, I know, it's ridiculous is the way I'd put it, Frank said. But I thought I'd ask, how old is this complex? Two years, and and no one has died on the premises, sir. I'm going crazy. Well, thank you, Frank said, and left the back office to his apartment. There wasn't much room to hide in his apartment, but he figured if one of Lena's friends wanted to play a prank on him, they could. He locked his door again and set his metal chair against it and placed three glasses on the chair. He figured if someone came in, he'd be out three glasses, but he'd get an answer. When he woke the next night, he found that the woman was back again, sitting on the edge of the bed, cradling an orange tabby, and muttering to it softly in a voice that was drizzled butter on a warm tortilla. Frank knew damn well that he did not have any pets in the apartment, and as he stood up to peer into the living area, he realized that the chair and glasses were still there. He turned back to the woman, who looked lovely as far as nonsensical aberrations went, small and frail-looking with skin the color of sawdust. She was sitting cross-legged in bed with the cat, unperturbed by the savage thumping of his heart, trying to keep enough blood going to his brain in order to make sense of the peaceful scene. Hello? The figure looked up. Some hope filtered through Frank. Maybe there was a response coming. Then she crinkled her nose and sneezed. A very real, authentically human sneeze. The sudden movement startled the cat, who flew from her lap and out the open door. The woman followed, calling, Mr. Fleabag, I'm sorry, and brushed past Frank, leaving the smell of lilac in her wake and shutting the door behind her. Frank reacted, opened the door, and bolted through the living room. Too late, he realized she was gone, and, unable to arrest his own speed, he slammed his little toe into the chair, knocking it off its place and sending the glasses to the ground to shatter like the remnants of his sleep. Frank, said Dimitri, Huh? What? Look alive. Boss is coming. Frank immediately straightened in his chair and flipped his desktop display to the last batch of research numbers that would be sent over to marketing. A tall man in a black polo and blue jeans stalked by the cubicle and popped his head in. Dimitri, Frank, we're going to need everything ready to run the tests tonight. You all cool with staying? I want to make sure everything's set to go before everyone starts leaving for their Christmas holidays. Yes, sir, Dimitri said, and Frank managed a nod. Good. See you guys, then. Frank, you all right there, bud? Yes, sir. Uh, Bad lunch. No details necessary. Send me an email when you guys finish. 
the boss said, and then resumed his walkthrough. As soon as he was clear, Frank placed his forehead down on his desk. Frank, man, you look like ass. Thanks. I mean it. What's going on? I haven't slept much in the past 48 hours. Lena problems? Nope. Then what? It's another woman. Dimitri let out a loud laugh that he quickly covered up with a makeshift coughing attack. You really love looking for trouble, man. But hey, if it keeps you up, it's got to be worth it, right? Right. And it was only Tuesday. He woke up in the middle of the night and felt great relief when he realized it was a full bladder that had roused him and not some weird event. He stood up, walked to the bathroom, and relieved himself. After finishing up, he ran his hands through soap and water and splashed his face. Once he looked up, he saw his reflection staring back at him through poorly shaved bristles and dark semicircles under his eyes. He flushed, and when he stepped back into the bedroom, he froze. The woman had returned. Well, he thought it was a woman, just looking much younger. There was another young girl with her, and the two sat cross-legged opposite each other, smiling at each other with four magazines strewn about them. Oh, God damn it! He started storming out of the bedroom when one of the girls spoke. I'm scared, said the one he was familiar with. What if I completely suck and he thinks I'm gross? He's not going to think you're gross, the other responded, curls bouncing off her face. I just never... Never what? I've never kissed anyone. Really? It's super fun. I don't know, said the first visitor, blushing. I can show you. But isn't that weird? We're best friends. Okay, but just a quick... Frank left the room feeling weird with himself and ended up making himself a makeshift pillow with his undershirt in the living room. On Wednesday, he was shaken awake by movement in his bed. It was the woman again, wearing a maroon and white nightgown. She looked to be in pain. Eyes closed, she was biting her lip when Frank realized he had seen that kind of face before. On the painter, on Lena, on his two college girlfriends, and that one drunken encounter he had with a classmate on his freshman year. He looked down to see that her knees were raised and one of her hands had disappeared under the covers. He felt a similar yet horrifying disturber below his waistline and rolled out of bed. He stepped into his closet and put on a pair of jeans, grabbed his keys, and walked down to his car to nap. He started his engine, rolled the windows down just a little bit, and turned on the heat. It was 2.35 in the morning and it was cold. Three hours later, there was a rap on the window, and he startled himself awake by hitting the horn and possibly startling the person who stood outside. He rolled down the window and looked up to see one of the grounds crew for the apartment complex staring at him. Yes? Sir, is everything fine? Yeah, I just, I just wanted to get to work early, so I went to sleep here, Frank said, because that made more sense than... Yeah, I can't sleep in my apartment anymore because some random girl keeps on fucking with any notion of sleep. Do you live here? Yes, 1127. Oh, okay, well then have a good day, sir. The man left and Frank decided to go back to the apartment. The woman was gone, his bed was empty, and the first of three cell phone alarms started buzzing. He slid the snooze button and unlocked the screen to call Dimitri. Frank? Yeah, I, I I wanted to give you a heads up. I don't think I can make it in today. What do you mean? I'm exhausted. I can barely stay conscious. Well, so am I, but if you don't show, the boss will flay me because it's just you and me working on the tests today. Where's Gerald? Called in sick. Strep. Fuck. It's exactly what I said. I really can't drive, man. Then I'll pick you up. You can get an extra hour of shut-eye, and then I'll pick you up on my way into town. All right, I can do that. But keep your phone on. 
fine. Frank put on his work polo, tucked it into his pants, and sat on the edge of the bed, leaning slightly left. He heard sleep call him to close his eyes, but it was only seconds before he reopened them. The woman was sitting next to him, looking as miserable as he felt, dark rings under her eyes, hair unkempt. She was younger, and she was breathing rapidly, anxious, tense. Tears started streaming down her face as she placed her left hand on her left thigh and then squeezed. She took a deep breath and then pressed something against the skin just above her knee. Frank realized it was a razor blade under a piece of paper towel and instinctively reached out to spot her arm away. That was when he realized the woman wasn't really there and he found himself both unable to stop her and unable to stop watching as she drew a perfectly straight red line with little pools of blood when the blade cut deeper. As she withdrew the edge, her tears stopped. Her eyes widened, and she immediately dropped the razor by Frank's feet and pressed the napkin against her skin. Blood seeped through in punctuation marks through the paper. Fuck, 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 she said to herself, and looked frantically around for something to replace the paper towel. A door slammed somewhere near, and the woman and Frank looked up at the same time. She stood up and quickly limped to the door and locked it. The napkin fell off, and Frank saw the mess the blood had made, now running freely down her kneecap and onto the top part of her shin as she pulled a t-shirt from under the bed and tied it around her leg. There was a knock somewhere near. Yeah? Hey, Daphne, we're back early. Your brother wasn't feeling well. You want to get some dinner? No, no, thanks, Mom. I don't feel good either. You kids. Okay, well, I'll leave you the leftovers in the fridge. Thanks, Mom. Footsteps receded outside, and Frank brushed his hand against his face. His cell phone was ringing. Hello? Hey, asshole, I've been calling you for five minutes. You ready to go? Headed down now. When Frank sat down in the passenger seat, Dimitri gave him a weird look. You know that you have the weekend to fool around with this woman, right? A weekend when we'll be done with this project? Daphne. What? Her name is Daphne, Frank said, leaning back and passing out. Daphne. The hour of traffic reinvigorated Frank enough to allow him to get through a 12-hour day at the office, hypnotized by Excel spreadsheets and the blue glare of the computer screen. Dimitri didn't even seem to mind that Frank would occasionally mutter Daphne's name as he was caught up in his own series of computerized tests. The blue sparks of light were his own brain cells dying. That night, Daphne was crying in bed. Frank woke up and faced her. She was younger again, and her long braided hair bounced as her shoulders heaved with sobs. Her hand clenched something tightly, a slip of matte paper with a picture on it. Frank looked closer and recognized the girl as the same girl he had seen with Daphne a few days earlier. A little older, but the curls were unmistakable. Below her picture, there were the words, Anne, forever an angel, and a date spanning 17 years and ending in 2005. The sobs he heard were those of a broken heart that would never mend. Frank laid close to Daphne and started crying with her. Friday was a success, and the mood at the office was significantly lighter now that the project had been completed. Frank thought about running Google searches for the name of the woman, but figured that would land him into one of several government watch lists. So he did his best to nap intermittently through the day while co-workers who would be taking off for their longer vacations routinely stopped by his cubicle to wish Dimitri and himself a Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays, depending on their particular political sensitivity and or paranoia. All right, fucker, Dimitri said. You can relax now, and I'm not going to let you go back home. What do you mean? I need sleep. Sleep? You napped during your lunch break. I need more naps. No, you need to have a few drinks. Company Christmas party. Let's go. But, 
but nothing. I'm driving you home anyway. Let's go. Frank shrugged and followed his co-worker out their cubicle pool, down a couple floors in their elevator. Where's the party at? Frank asked. Some bar downtown. Johnny's, I think. You think? Okay, it's at Johnny's. I've never been. It's a pretty cool place. It's just over there. Whoa, watch it, Dimitri said, pulling Frank away from a collision with a streetlight. Man, you are so out of it. Wake up so you can get proper fucked up. Okay. They arrived at the bar a few blocks later and began exchanging what-ups and other mindless pleasantries with the co-workers on their floor and a few from other departments in the company. Four pints in and Frank was starting to feel pretty good. Numb. Floating in sound. Hey, a man's voice said behind him. He turned to see someone that looked familiar. You're Frank, right? The man said. Frank recognized him as Adrian, the man who had sold him the mattress a week earlier. Yeah, Adrian? That's me, Adrian said, laughing. Long time, huh? Yeah, Frank said, shaking the man's hand. Long time. Sorry, he said, blinking. It's been a hell of a week. I understand. Everyone's leaving, so they're pushing everything to be done today. We still have one more week. Oh, sorry. Let me introduce you to my wife, Adrian said, and turned to nudge the woman behind him. As she turned, Adrian continued, Hey, honey, this is the guy that bought your mattress. Frank, this is my wife. Daphne, Frank said, staring at the same woman who had been in his bedroom for the last week. Wait, you know each other? Adrian asked, looking as confused as his wife did. No, she said. How do you know me? Sorry, I just... You looked like a Daphne. How does one look like a Daphne? She asked, annoyed. I don't... I don't know, Frank said. Sorry. Daphne? Dimitri asked, coming up behind Frank. Is this the one you've been yapping about all week? Excuse me? Both Adrian and Daphne said at the same time. Oh, I mean, well, shit, Frank, what's going on? Yeah, buddy, you better start. I know, Frank said, deadpan. Know what? I know you bailed on your dad for lunch. I know there was a cat named Mr. Fleabag. Frank rubbed his left hand across his face. I know Jen knew about the engagement. Are you some sort of stalker? She asked nervously. Adrian looked like he was about to take a swing. No, I just... He reached out to touch her, and as she pulled away, he was able to make a physical connection. She was real. You're not going to believe me. Then you better start explaining. Frank, let's go. You're being weird, Dimitri said and placed his hand on Frank's chest to drag him away. I know, Daphne. I know the scar on your left leg. That was a torn ACL, you creep, Adrian said, and Frank shook his head. That's not how she got it, Daphne, Frank said, his voice cracking. I know about your first kiss, and I'm sorry about Anne. Honey, what is he talking about? Adrian asked. Get out. Get the fuck out, you fucking weirdo. All right, Frank, let's go. You're making a scene, Dimitri said pulling Frank away. Frank complied, muttering sorries as he let himself be dragged out of the bar. You need to get your shit together, Frank. Let's take your ass home. Frank wasn't sleeping that night. He didn't want to sleep anymore. He had his TV turned on full blast, having had dragged it from his bedroom to the living room. His third cup of coffee was half empty and precariously balanced on a small saucer on his lap. There was a knock on the door. For a second, Frank thought he was sleeping again, but the knocks continued. After the sixth knock, he told the sound that he was going, and he was going, damn it. He opened the door and saw Daphne there. The real Daphne, not the other real Daphne. She stepped inside and closed the door behind her. How? Does it matter? How did you know about Anne? The only one who knew about her was me. 
The only one who knew about my scar was me. How did you know? Please, she said, tears streaming down her face. I saw it. Don't fuck with me. How? He shook his head. You don't really... I want to know, she said. Please. He stood up and led her to the bedroom, where he pointed at the mattress. That's where I see her. That's where I saw you. Whenever I tried to sleep, I saw you. She stepped inside the bedroom. Show me. Daphne, I don't think I want to see her again. Hugo Esteban Rodriguez is a citizen of the former Republic of Rio Grande and received his undergraduate degrees in mass communication and history from the University of Texas at Brownsville and his MFA in creative writing from the University of Texas at El Paso. He is an assistant editor for Bartleby Snopes and his work has been published in the Argonaut, Spirits Tincture, Picaroon Poetry, and Donut Factory. He loves sports, tacos, metal, and spending time with his girlfriend and fur children. And yes, he is a total taco snob. <laughs>